Hello everybody and welcome to another night together as Eastgate Baptist Church presents our midweek virtual connection group. I hope that uh, this is going to be an engaging time tonight as we discuss what conversion looks like. And I know that word garners all kinds of effects, but tonight we're going to be focusing on definitions uh, and what defines us, what makes Christianity Christianity, what makes the gospel actually good news, and why this hope is found in Jesus Christ. And so tonight we're going to be looking at the, the Bible in John chapter 3, uh, continuing where we left off last week in this conversation with Nicodemus at night, and what it means to, to give us the clear, defined message of following Christ, of salvation, of this terminology we use as being born again. So we're going to be looking at that together. But also these times together are an opportunity for us to pray for one another as we prepare our hearts to spend time in God's Word together. And I would ask you, I would encourage you if you have um, some needs or, or some burdens laid on your heart. If you would like to share those and there's ways we can pray for you, you can certainly comment or message us if you want to do it discreetly. That's uh, more than welcome to do so. And we would love to be praying for you, encouraging you, helping you take your next step with Jesus, uh, helping you grow in your faith with Jesus. So please, please, please uh, feel free to share with those. And tonight, um, as we think about the term definition, what defines us, uh, a couple of years ago, the big rage was having a high definition television, flat screen, uh, that, that by having these high definition televisions, you would be able to be clearer in your picture of what was going on, everything would be better, because you would see things in a clearer view. You would have a less construed view. You would have a wide screen. You would have greater pixels and that kind of thing. And so you wouldn't just be getting the same thing everyone was getting. You would be getting a higher definition, higher high def. Um, now it's 4K or 8K or ultra high def, you know, all these kind of things. But the whole goal is to have a clearer picture. And as we think about the word definition, that is something that's definitely needed in the church today to be communicated to the world today. Why is that? Because sometimes we get mixed up terms. You'll find that this group and this group use the exact same word, the exact same vocabulary, but when you really filter down, you see that this definition is far distinct from this definition. And tonight, if we're thinking about what it means to be a Christian, and what it means to tell others about being a Christian, being a follower of Jesus, being born again, being a believer. Those terminologies of what it means to be a Christian. Some people may use the same vocabulary, but their definition is different. And we're asking God to give us a heart that is defined by him and that is high definition for others around us so that they will clearly see who Jesus is, and what it means to follow him. And so, if we can be praying for you, encouraging you, uh, please, once again, reach out to us, comment in the comment button, uh, comment bar, or you can message us if you don't want it to be out in public. Uh, but uh, we, each week, uh, our church prays for those burdens that are on people's souls, but not only the burdens and the things that weigh us down. We celebrate with those who celebrate. This week, I'm thankful that those who uh, were looking for jobs. Many of them got good news this week that they're able to get back to work, and we're so grateful that that, uh, that opportunity has been afforded to them. Uh, this week, we've had hurting people with uh, families that have lost loved ones, but yet they celebrate the hope that they have. Their loved ones are with the Lord Jesus. Uh, today was a particularly beautiful time with a family uh, of a longtime member, a member of our church from 1958, have, has been a member that long, but the last 11 years has been homebound and living in assisted living and went home to be with the Lord. And while it was a time of mourning and grief with the family, it was also a bittersweet time of celebration. So we lift up and praise God for his preservation and his keeping of his children. 
So we want to certainly share those requests. Uh, pray for me tomorrow. I will be doing another funeral uh, of uh, a former member's family. And uh, I would just ask that you pray for me. I, I always need people to pray for me that I would never uh, muddle the gospel, that I would speak clearly as I ought and faithfully as I ought. Uh, I would ask that you pray for me in that area and that not only would I speak clearly, but my life would model clearly the gospel. Uh, that would be a way you could pray for me and I would ask you to do so. But let's pray together. Also, right now, um, pray for uh, uh, a church member's mother, uh, Jeremy Richardson's mother. Um, she is being taken to the hospital. Uh, and I would just ask that you would pause right now as we pray. We're going to be lifting them up in prayer as well. So would you do that with me? Let's pray. Lord God, tonight we recognize that you are holy, you are mighty, you are God, and you are good, and that nothing, nothing, nothing can thwart your purposes, can thwart your will, and we're grateful for that, that you are God who is almighty and powerful and good, and I'm thankful that we can present our request to you, that you hear what is on our hearts, that you ask us to cast our cares on on you because you care for us and tonight uh, we we celebrate the the matters that you have provided for that you have sustained and kept when it comes to people going home to be with you but we also want to ask you in this moment of need that you would work mightily in the life of uh, our church family and, and the families of our church family particularly uh, with the richardson's uh, the, the, the mother that is being taken to the hospital as of right now. And I pray that you would work through the doctor's hands to give them wisdom, to give uh, great grace and peace to the family and comfort in this moment of, of struggle, trying to figure out what is going on. And uh, that you would show yourself as the God of all glory, the God of all love, the God of all grace. And um, in the middle of it, we would see your peace. Lord, I thank you that this week we have much to celebrate because you never leave us or forsake us. You provide for us and we live and breathe because your word sustains us. And I pray that as we live and breathe, you would help us to be faithful, to live out your will on the earth as it is in heaven. And that as we have these longings for provision, we remember that you give daily bread and that you forgive us so that we also, we must forgive others and share that grace that has been given to us. We know that we cannot save another soul, but we know that we can spread the message of how you saved us. And I pray that we would do so, and that in the middle of walking with you, in the middle of these days that require such wisdom and seizing the opportunities that have been granted to us, I pray that you would not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil, and that in all things that happen, you would receive praise, glory, honor, that you are due. Help us worship you today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right, so tonight's question is going to be looking at this conversation that happened about 2,000 years ago with Jesus and Nicodemus, these two Middle Eastern men who did not speak English, uh, who did not look like I look, um, but nevertheless is recorded in this ancient and yet timeless text we call the Bible, the Holy Scripture. It's inerrant, it's inspired, it's infallible, and it is perfect and relevant for us today because in it there are lots of vocabulary words that people all over the world will use, but we're going to see a clarified definition of conversion, of salvation, of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And people have lots of different ideas about what it means to be a Christian. When they talk about what being a good Christian man or a good Christian woman looks like. Um, and some people have really wrong ideas. They have different ideas and some of them are really wrong. Uh, some people think, I'm born a Christian. I was born to a Christian believing family or a church going family or I was born American, um, or I was born of a certain background, a uh, certain heritage. So they think they're just born Christian. But we're going to see that is not how this takes place. 
Others think that being a Christian is simply just not being an atheist. If you believe in God, then I guess you're a Christian, right? That fills in the bubble. Ink wrong. Not that is not it. Just because you believe in a deity, believe in something spiritual, does not make you a Christian. It does not make you a follower of Jesus, a disciple of God. Um, and some people think that a Christian is anyone who believes in God. They name him God, and is nice, is kind, is polite and uh, pleasant. Uh, and some people. They think that if anyone has walked down an aisle and prayed a certain prayer, they are a Christian. That's, that's, they did it. That, that checks off all the boxes. But here's the question, and, and you can feel free to comment. You can feel free to share. Why do you think people have so many different ideas about what makes someone a Christian? These are all different ideas. Why do you think people have so many different ideas about what makes someone a Christian? And, and maybe even, what do you think makes someone a Christian? You can feel free to share that, even your own walk with the Lord, if you, if you want to. But why do you think it is? Well, if we're talking about this, and all these different ideas, they all come from somewhere. And they come from a lack of definition. Using similar vocabulary, but not really defining the terms. Not and and not having the right filter to define the terms. You see, if we use a filter of trend or tradition or heritage or history, uh, that can lead us into obscure different ways. But if we have a filter, a foundation that says this is the vocabulary and this is the definition, the Bible is not to be treated as a dictionary, but it does help us. In fact, it is the authority upon which our terms are defined, on what makes a Christian a Christian, what makes conversion conversion, what makes the gospel good news. And according to the authority of Scripture, this is a simple definition as I can put it and that others have put it, a Christian is someone who trusts in Jesus as their Savior and Lord, as the Savior and Lord. This means that a Christian is someone who totally depends on Jesus Christ alone to save them from their sin. And who, because of that trust, obediently submits to his rule over their life. Let me, let me clarify that again. According to Scripture, a Christian is someone who has trusted in Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. This means that a Christian is someone who is now totally dependent on Christ Jesus to save them from their sin and because of it, obediently submits to his rule over their life. And as we're going to see today in this conversation that Jesus has with Nicodemus, this is foundational for sharing it with others. If we don't have the right definition of this term, this what conversion looks like, what salvation looks like, what it means to be born again, we don't have the right foundation for sharing with others. And what we do share with others ends up muddying what Christ has presented for us as the one and only way to salvation, the one and only way to peace with God. And the Gospel of John is helping us to unpack this, to see Jesus for who he is, for what he alone can do and what he alone has said about our salvation. It's helping us to understand this. So when we look at this, we need to ask this question. What are some wrong ideas that are out there about what it means to be a Christian? And, and where do these ideas go wrong? If you want to comment, I would love to see your comments as we're looking at this. Um, I, I love that we are dialoguing and following along live together, watching together. Some of you will watch this or be watching this at a later time through Facebook or, or YouTube on some of our social media channels. But what are some wrong ideas people have about what it means to be a Christian? We kind of talked about a few of those earlier. Um, some mean, believe it, it means that you, you go to church. Um, that's, that's what it means to be a Christian. The people that go to church are Christians. Well, I want to tell you this, and, and this is a blunt way that was put to me a long time ago. If you stepped into a garage 
it does not make you a mechanic. If you walk into the airport, it does not make you a pilot. If you go into a restaurant, it does not make you a chef. None of these things make you something just because you entered a facility where other people are partaking the same thing. And so going to church does not automatically make you a Christian. Uh, just like me stepping on a softball field or whatever field makes me a great athlete. It doesn't. But sometimes people b believe that this is what makes you a Christian. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a, a, an illustration. Some people believe being kind to others is what makes you a Christian. Like, that's, that's the only thing you do. You just have to be kind, uh, which is really weird that a person that's kind is a Christian. Um, it's, it's very odd. Um, yeah, some just believing in God or a God makes them a Christian. Um, as we said before, some people believe that you're just born in the right place then, or born to a certain people, then you're a Christian. You know, I've heard people in conversations that, oh, I've been a Christian my whole life. Well, no, no, you haven't. You, you just, that is utterly impossible. I mean, you may be speaking in hyperbole and saying the majority of your life, if you came to faith at an early age or, or predominant part of your life, the majority of your life, but you have not been a Christian your whole life. Um, so these, these ideas go wrong because we think I am a Christian based on my family heritage. I am a Christian based on the tradition I was raised in. I am a Christian based on the geography I was raised in. I am a Christian based on um, the, the way I behave in society. And you can be a Christian while having these things, but these things don't make you a Christian. What does it mean to be a Christian? If you were trying to define that and, and someone asked you that question, what does it mean to be a Christian? Or how does someone become a Christian? If these things don't make you a Christian, how would you say, how would you explain what makes you a Christian? And how you answer that, it defines how you evangelize, how you share this message. If you don't have a clear answer, you don't have a clear sharing. If you have a clear answer, it helps you to present a clear message. And, it, and it's needed for us in our lives as Christians and in the life of a church to have a well-grounded, well-founded, biblical definition of salvation, of being a Christian, of being a follower of Christ. And this is important for the church because the church, if it has a well-founded and well-grounded biblical definition based on what Jesus has told us, because he is the one that provides salvation, so he would be the one that shares with us what salvation is. If we have that, it helps us to clearly share that news with those who need to hear it, which is the lost world, anyone without Christ. And if we don't, then what can happen is we end up hindering the gospel message. Here's how it does it. It can hinder it by saying merely by doing good deeds, we are earning our salvation or we are sharing salvation by good deeds. No, no one can be saved by works. That's not us. That's not anyone. And if we do not share the gospel, we are telling the world while being kind, you can be saved in this way, which is absolutely false. It is not grounded on the word. And so we need to be able to share the gospel. Um, if we celebrate that, that salvation is just going to a certain church that sings a certain thing um, and lives in a certain part of the world and does certain activities, um, what we're saying is that anybody outside of that bubble can't be saved. That's, that's a hindrance. So we need to be really clear about this. And, and yes, we can use the terms about salvation, about being a Christian, but we need to have the definition. And so when we think about this, this well-founded presentation of the gospel, that according to Scripture, a person who trusts in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, as the Savior and Lord, is the only way someone is saved, it helps us to clearly share that with others. Uh, it shows us that this is what total dependence is. All right, so let's see this conversation. Let's not just talk and talk and talk. 
Um, let's look at this conversation. It says in John chapter 3, verses 1 through 8, there was a man from the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to him, him being Jesus, at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. We recognize you came from God. There's something spiritual about you. For no one could perform these signs you do unless God were with him. And Jesus replied, Truly I tell you, unless someone is born again, he cannot, cannot, this is why this is so needed, right? He cannot see the kingdom of God. Well, how can someone, anyone be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked him. Can he enter his mother's womb a second time and be born? And Jesus answered, Truly I tell you, unless someone is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Whatever is born of the flesh is flesh. Whatever is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I told you you must be born again. You must be born again. The wind blows where it pleases, and you hear its sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. So when we look at this life of Nicodemus, as we talked about last week, we see this is a man who has a favorable life, who comes from the right geography, if you will, uh, the right background, the right heritage, the right history, and, and he's educated, and he's pious, and he's under a select group of devout people seeking to follow the commands of the Old Testament. He has all these things that would mark, all right, so if we're looking for a worldly definition of a righteous dude, it would be Nicodemus. But here's the problem. A righteous definition of from the world's perspective, is not righteousness in God's eyes. And Jesus tells us that what is required for salvation, what is required for us to have the kingdom, to be born again and see the kingdom, is God to do something in us that we cannot do for ourselves. To God provide for us something we cannot achieve for ourselves. So what does this mean? Once again, trying to say what is the high definition view of what a Christian is. Looking at it clearly, not just using similar terms and similar vocabulary, but what does it biblically mean? It means Christians aren't born. They're made, they, but they are made. They are made anew by God. Christians, are, we aren't born Christians. We are made Christians by Christ. Uh, Jesus, this is what he meant when he said that Christians are people that are born again. And here's the thing, born again. What did you, you looking at this video, have to do with you being born? What did you have to do with it? Nothing. We had nothing to do with us being born. That was an activity that God brought about between a mother and a father and all the, the, the properties of that taking place. For us to come into this world and God had to knit us together in our mother's womb in that process. That's how God did it. We, you and I, had no part in the being born. That was, We were born, but it was of something else taking place. And this is the similar way we look at being born again. We do not have the role in being born again. Christ does. It's experiencing a birth, a new birth from above based on what Christ has done here on this earth. So Jesus is talking about salvation and defining what that looks like to a man who from the worldly checklist looked like a righteous dude, but he was not saved. He did not have that peace with God. He could not see the kingdom until he would be born again. And the Bible is talking about salvation. Jesus is talking about salvation. New life found in what he alone can do for us, in us, through us, with us. But it is his work. Salvation is, is the term of how the Holy Spirit of God works in the life of an individual to bring them into the family of God, to bring them and usher them into this adoption. And this happens when we respond to his work in us. We express our belief, our trust in what Jesus has done through his 
death on the cross and his resurrection from the grave and we accept, we trust that he is indeed Savior and Lord and that he alone is Savior and Lord. The Bible is making it clear that only those who believe in Jesus Christ can be saved. Only those. And, and they can be saved from what? Their sin. See, that's what we need saved from. We need saved from our sin, from our condemnation. And you may think, well, what is sin, Pastor? Sin is all the ways and any way that we disobey God. It's all the ways and any way in which we disobey God. And for us to have and enjoy eternal life with Jesus, we must be saved by Jesus. And before we're born again, you may think, well, I, I can see that there's broken things. I, I can see that something's not right. And, I, and, and, I, and something needs to change. Yes, you may have a clue about that. And you may aim towards doing something about that. But only in what Jesus has done and what Jesus has promised and what Jesus provides in the gift of him going to the cross for our sins and rising again victoriously to gift us eternal life, only in him can we have what needs to be restored. We see this continuing the conversation, looking in verses 16 through 18. Verse 16 through 18, it says, Jesus says to him, For God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only Son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Anyone who believes in him is not condemned, but anyone who does not believe is already condemned. This is because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. This is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and avoids it so that his deeds may not be exposed. But anyone who lives by the truth comes to the light so that his works may be shown to be accomplished by God. So Jesus is telling us that we must believe in him. And, and so what do you think it means to believe in Jesus? Once again, that's an easy term to to use in vocabulary, but not be defined the same. And, and we need to know why this is important. What does it mean to believe in Jesus? Looking at this, when we ask, what does it mean to believe in Jesus? People will use that term and not mean the same thing. Uh, but this means we must place our trust, our lives on who he alone is and what he alone can do. Because if we're depending on our own story, we find ourselves like Nicodemus. When we look at a Nicodemus story, we see here's a man that looks like he has it all together. And, and it's amazing that he is being told bluntly by Jesus because Jesus loves him enough to care and share what this salvation looks like. He says, truly I tell you, Nicodemus, you who are a ruler of Israel, you, you are part of the Sanhedrin, you're a Pharisee, you're educated, you come from the right people, you speak the right language, all the things that you would say worldly, check off your list. Unless someone is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. He's telling Nicodemus, unless you do this, all this other stuff doesn't matter. All this other stuff doesn't matter. The world will say it matters, and the world will say it's good, and, and those are good things. But only being born again can save you. Only being born again can redeem you. And God's love is what made salvation available to us. We weren't owed it. We didn't deserve it. We couldn't earn it. We didn't even have a right to beg for it. But God loves us in spite of that. In fact, if you look biblically, we didn't beg for it. We didn't plead for it. We might try to achieve our own status a different way, but we didn't ask God to do this 
for us. God's love chose to do this for us. He made salvation available to the whole world through the sacrificial death of His Son. This is what Jesus has done on our behalf. It's Jesus who paid the price for our sins. This is what the message of the cross is all about. This is when it says that God gave His one and only Son. This is what it means that He sent His only Son. But here's the thing. Salvation comes only to those who believe on Christ who trust in Christ in his death on the cross. Because the Bible lets us know that if you do not believe on him, if you do not trust him, you remain condemned in your sins. You remain in the prison cell of death and sin and slavery in the dark world of evil because you have chosen not to trust the one who opened the door that you could not open, who flung it open and presented freedom to you. You've chosen to stay and try to remain in darkness and stay where your sins keep you instead of trusting in the one who purchased the way for freedom. And when we believe in him, when we trust in him, the Bible says on the basis of faith, nothing you could do, nothing you could earn, nothing you could say, but merely trusting that Jesus, you you are who you say you are. I haven't made you Savior and Lord. You are Savior and Lord. Jesus, you died for me. I didn't deserve for you to do that. I didn't even ask for you to do that. But you did it and demonstrated that while I was still a sinner, you died for me. I trust in you. I ask you to forgive me. Based on what you alone have done. What you alone have provided. When we believe in Him, we're restored in a relationship. It says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, calling on Him to save us. And that means we are no longer separated from Him. Because our sin, our condemnation is what separates from Him. It says we're no longer under judgment because He, uh, he makes peace with that based on His perfect payment on the cross. The check cleared. A check is something that people would write to pay for things. Um, that when they did not have cash in their pocket and they, you know, they did not use a piece of plastic. It cleared. And the result of this restoration is eternal life, not a partial life, eternal life, meaning that even after our physical death, when, when the, the way of our bodies are frail and come, succumb to physical death, we will live forever in the presence of God. And John... The Gospel of John is all about showing what a changed life looks like. The message of Jesus to Nicodemus. He's saying we testify to what we and speak, what we, we have seen, but you don't accept our testimony. He's saying we have seen life change. I have witnessed life change. I have brought about life change, Jesus is telling Nicodemus. And this is evident because only Jesus can do this. And that's the message from Jesus to Nicodemus, a person that by all counts would look good on a worldly record, but needed salvation, needed conversion, needed to be born again, a work that only God can do, and biblically God will do. Because He has made that promise to us. Not because we deserve it. Salvation is the work of God internally, through the Holy Spirit, and as He works in us and has saved us, it will also begin expressing itself outwardly in, in our godly living. And part of that godly living means we take what we have received, what God has clearly spoken to us through His Word, this biblical definition of salvation, of conversion, and we express it to others. You see, that's the part where it gets muddy and, and we start getting a little hesitant. Godly living includes sharing the message. It includes evangelism, telling the good news, telling non-Christians the good news about what Jesus has done to save a sinner like you and me. And this message demands a response, just like it demanded a response on us. 
that God working on us drew us to respond to him. And so we must therefore urge people to repent and believe, just like someone urged us that, that this message is not something to be taken lightly. It's not something to be put on a shelf and considered later. And yet, we must remember, this is something that cannot be manipulated. It must not be. Only God can bring about that response. Only God can lead a soul to Him. Only God can change and convert a human heart. So we as a people shouldn't try to, uh, you know, elbow someone into a, a response. We shouldn't try to coerce anyone or force someone. It may be satisfying to us. It may boost our numbers. Yet it could be not true repentance and faith. And what does that leave that person? It leaves them without hope. It leaves them without salvation. It leaves them without peace with God. And it can leave them discouraged in their walk with the Lord. And so we need to understand that we have a role in evangelism to share the good news and to pray that God would work, but trust as he works in their life that as we provide this encouragement of evangelism, that people will experience the joy and blessing of receiving that good news. And looking at this, we see how this presents hope. But let us be clear. Verses 19 to 21, it says, this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. We understand there's a difference when someone responds to faith and when they don't. Life change occurs because it says anyone who lives by the truth comes to the light so that his works may be shown to be accomplished by God. We see this uh, and recognize what true faith looks like. It's not merely words. Biblically, biblically defined, biblically clarified conversion, it is seen by a life that reflects Jesus' work in them, on them, through them, with them. We see this in the life of the Apostle Paul. Here's another person that, by all accounts, worldly had the right background, the right history, the right ancestry, the right education, the right piety. And yet he says in his letter to young Timothy, he says, I give thanks to Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful. He appointed me to the ministry even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an arrogant man. But I received mercy because I acted out of ignorance in unbelief. And in the, gr the grace of our Lord overflowed along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. And this saying is now trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And I am the worst of them. But I received mercy for this reason, so that in me, the worst of them, Christ Jesus might demonstrate his extraordinary patience as an example to those who would believe in him for eternal life. In other words, Paul's saying, if you can look at me, what Christ has done in me, you can see what is possible for Christ to do in you. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And see, we look in this text that Paul writes, he says, this is what characterized my life before I placed faith in and trust in Christ. I was against him. I was a blasphemer of him. I was a persecutor of anyone who chose to follow him. And I was an arrogant man. I thought I knew it all. But Paul says that he received mercy, that Jesus displayed mercy to him and brought about this life change all so that that message that he received and trusted, that gift that he took based on what Jesus had given him, he could also give it to others. That they would see his life and say, wow, if Jesus can save someone like him, Jesus can save someone like me. Man, what a way to clearly define what our life is meant to be about. That we're to take this good news and share it with others. That if Jesus can save us, he can save anyone. 
but we must be about sharing that message clearly, not muddling it up, not telling people that, oh, if you're just kind enough, you're a Christian. Or if, if you're an American, you're just born a Christian. Or if, if you just walk in the doors of a church, it automatically makes you a Christian. No, no, no. If you are charitable, you're a Christian. No. Only those who place their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as the one and only Savior and Lord will be saved. And out of that salvation, their life is transformed as they obediently trust in the one they trusted in. This is what conversion looks like. So think about this as you leave. How did you become a Christian? Think about going back to that story. Oh, that we could go back to the days when we first heard about Christ. Not that we're trying to be reconverted every week. That's not, that's not the goal. But to be renewed with what Jesus did for us. And then sharing that experience with others. Usually in the days where we trusted in Christ, there was a desire to let other people know this good news that happened to us. May we return to what that looked like in our life, to have that fervor. And, and think about also the people in your life, that people that claim to be a Christian based on the wrong vocabulary, based on the wrong definition. Their beliefs and their life do not match the New Testament biblical definition of a Christian. Think about how you might can minister to them. Help have a conversation with them. Some of you that are watching today, you were clearly saved because you were talking to someone and they asked you, what do you think it means to be a Christian? And whenever you gave your answer, they said, nah, bro, nah, sis, that's not it. Biblically, that is not it. Let me show you what the Bible says about being a Christian what it means about being a follower of Jesus, and to do so in love because you care for that person. And then think about how evangelism is not only an individual responsibility, it's also something corporately we do as a church. May it be our goal to celebrate telling people about Jesus. Not only on Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. when we gather here to worship, or you gather online, or when you share a video from your church, but the life of the church, everything we do lives and breathes that the message of Jesus must be clearly, clearly shared so that people can clearly, clearly respond to his good news. I hope this helps you tonight. I hope this helps you understand what conversion is. And, and, and if you feel like you want to share this video, please do so. But do so with the prayer that, that God help me have this conversation to help someone else clearly follow you. I hope that will be a useful tool for you. And if you have questions for us, if you would like more answers about your questions and, and, and need encouragement or people to pray for you, I, I ask that you reach out to us here at Eastgate. We would love to be that resource, that tool in your life to help further your walk with Jesus. I thank you for being with us tonight. Uh, please, if you have any questions, comment, message us, find us on eastgatebaptist.org. And if you're in the Flint, Michigan area, we would love to be a home church for you or to point you to a church that you're close to in your community, a Bible-teaching, Jesus-professing church that worships and honors the Lord and seeks to make Him known. Um, please reach out to us. Until next time, thanks. This has been our midweek virtual worship gathering. I hope it's been helpful. And may God bless you richly as you seek to follow Jesus this week. Thanks again. Bye-bye.